Um, what can you say, <laughs> trying to get you to summarize this in a soundbite, yeah. uh, about the direction of the MCU and kind of your vision going forward? Is there anything you want to clarify? Uh, the Marvels comes out on Friday. Fair and equal representation on film is incredibly important. Put another gay diverse woman in it, make it more fucking lame. So many different women and girls and boys and men will be able to relate to them. I do not need a 40 year old white dude. Of course, we were inspired by Kelly Sue DeConnick's runs of Captain Marvel in 2012 and 2014. And if you don't like my politics, don't buy my book. She's wonderful. She's a creative consultant with us. The industry has contracted and we're in, we're very worried about comics right now. Disney stock just keeps going down and down and down. And then Bob Iger is all like, nah, nah, what's going on with my stock? I don't know, does anyone want me to do it again? <laughs> like many women around the world watched Avengers Endgame and had that six seconds of all the, all the Marvel women together. And I, I once had like chills, but I also was very annoyed. I was like, two hours of this, please. I'm from the Tri-State area, I was a big nerd. I loved Marvel heroes. Um, and I wrote a lot of fan fiction. Nerdgerotic.com. Greetings, you over 881,000 wonderful people and the 40% who haven't subscribed yet. You're not so bad either. The MCU has come full circle, jerk. It's been a long road to get here and I've had this date marked on my calendar all year. And yes, YouTuber Christmas has come early because the Marvels has arrived. Now I know the fives and tens of you out there who watched the Marvels did your homework in preparation. You went back and watched Captain Marvel, the billion dollar patriarchy smashing blockbuster, showing the MCU's most powerful superhero go through the hero's journey. What's the hero's journey? Well, Carol Danvers' Captain Marvel was great all along and she was just being held down by an unjust system, which was, you guessed it, the patriarchy. I'm positive you went back and watched all of WandaVision, which introduced Monica Rambeau, whose origin was walking through a magical barrier while being positively affirmed. And her hero's journey was completed when she let a complete psychopath who tortured women and children go to go on and murder countless people in multiple dimensions for fake children. Then of course you have to rewatch Miss Marvel, based on the really popular character from multiple canceled comics, a show that received the highest praise from the critics on Rotten Tomatoes and the lowest ratings for a Marvel show on D+. And if you haven't seen it, then you missed her exciting origin, receiving a bracelet in the mail from her grandma. Oh, but we're not done there. Then there's Secret Invasion for Nick Fury, who was completely destroyed in the Captain Marvel movie when he lost his eye to a kitty cat, a story about a little boy scroll who grows up to want to kill the entire human race because Nick Fury broke a promise to him. It's also about the once formidable Nick Fury embracing his strange kind of love, which is supposed to be an allegory for something, but I can't quite put my finger on it. Well, how about that? So after watching all that, you're ready to watch the Marvels, but once you sit down in the theater and take in about 20 minutes or so, you realize you don't need to watch any of it, but you're still gonna feel like you're missing something, and you are. A story. The Marvels was a disaster a long time in the making. Of course, Captain Marvel did great when it was sandwiched in between two of the biggest sequels of all time, and she was forced in with other heroes that we actually liked. But some of us recognize right away that Carol Danvers is just not that interesting of a character to warn her own solo film, much less a sequel. And we were proven right long before this film came out when they demoted Captain Marvel in her own sequel. But as hard as Disney Marvel tried to spin, the ruse was up once we started getting the box office projections. And then the bad reviews came in from the critics that once protected Captain Marvel with their lives. It came out at 54% on Rotten Tomatoes, but of course there was a 3 a.m. ballot dump and it magically became fresh. But if you go to the top critics, it tells another story. On a side note, the feminist website Jezebel shut down after 16 years on the day the Marvels comes out. The world is healing. Well, I put this off long enough. It's time to talk about a film whose first reported budget was over a quarter of a billion dollars and it's gone well over that thanks to multiple reshoots and multiple delays. One of the most unanticipated sequels of all time and the end of the MCU and Disney Marvel, The Marvels. So how bad was it? One does not simply walk into the Marvels expecting a good movie. The creative bankruptcy there is guarded by more than morons. There is intersectional evil that does not sleep and the great mouse is ever watchful. 
Simply put, it's a series of disconnected events with characters you don't care about in a short film that feels long. No expectations subverted here, it's fan fiction that makes fan fiction look bad. One thing I can tell you is that the eight hour live stream promoting the Marvels featuring cats running around and humans fondling pop vinyls was more entertaining. Is it the worst Marvel film? Now I know it's been two years since everyone forgot about the Eternals, but could it be that bad? Maybe, but let's give credit where credit is due. Through Disney Marvel's push for representation, we now have two Marvel flops directed by diverse women. Now that's what I call progress. The Marvel starts out introducing us to a brand new villain, a gender and race swap villain from the comics, Dar Ben. She comes off as a soccer mom in cosplay who was essentially a dollar store Ronan the Accuser who we will call Woman the Accuser from here on out. She's on a mission to find the other bracelet that Kamala Khan's grandma didn't send out so she can steal the plot from Spaceballs. Just in case you watched the final Marvel's trailer before they released the film, you might be under the impression that Woman the Accuser is finishing Thanos' work. My work is inevitable. There will always be more to finish it. This is a lie. No, in truth, which is something Disney Marvel has no interest in these days. It's about a Kree girl boss wanting uh -huh. to steal air, water, and a sun from planets connected to Captain Marvel. I know what you're thinking. I don't remember any setup for this in all of the homework required to watch this film. And you'd be right, because it wasn't there, and we'll get to that. In what was theoretically a good move, Disney Marvel, realizing that the vast majority of you didn't watch their D-plus crap, decided to give us a brief recap of just two of the three main characters. Kamala Khan gets an annoying animated sequence, and in the grand tradition of the Doctor Strange Mall memory store, Captain Marvel, for some reason, hung on to the scroll torture device memory tiaras. From the first Captain Marvel movie, which none of you were insane enough to go back and re watch but is quite frankly better than this film just a little bit also she could access exposition for the audience which was a total waste of time because there wasn't an audience the plot if you want to call it one goes something like this after woman the accuser gets the one bracelet kamala khan's grandma forgot to send her she opens up a portal and it doesn't close back up. This causes a surge in the intergalactic space-time jump system. A quick aside, this intergalactic space-time jump system is being monitored and controlled by Saber and Nick Fury. I seem to recall a D-plus series that dropped this past summer that centered around Nick Fury's inability to find the scrolls a home and the consequences of that. Aside from the genocide that the one million scrolls that snuck onto Earth behind Nick Fury's back wanted to commit, considering Nick Fury was in charge of a space-time portal, maybe Gravik had a point until you realize the scrolls are an advanced spacefaring race that could have built themselves a ship to go through the space-time portals instead of wasting their time on a magic bullshit machine that made Amelia Clark the most powerful hero in the MCU. Anyway, I digress from one dumb D-plus TV show to one dumb Disney Marvel movie. Due to the damage caused by Woman the Accuser while simultaneously using the bracelet that Kamala Khan's grandma forgot to send her and the universal weapon which used to belong to Ronan, we get some vaguely described energy leaking from the space holes. Carol Danvers, our titular hero. Oh, wait a second. She's not the titular hero because she was demoted in her own sequel. Anyway, Carol Danvers, Danvers and Monica Rambeau investigate the vaguely defined energy leaking from the space holes and touch it. This causes our three heroes with vaguely defined energy powers that range from omnipotent to useless to become entangled. No, not that kind of entangled. According to the movie, the power entanglement, which is the characters switching places, only happens when they use their powers at the same time, except when they use their powers multiple times and the switch doesn't happen. Is it explained? No. Um, and I wrote a lot of fan fiction. Unintentional hilarity mixed with abject boredom ensues as our three heroes pursue Woman the Accuser as she tries to save her planet Hala by sucking out the atmosphere, the entire ocean, and a sun from three prospective planets. Suck, suck, suck! You thought I was kidding when I said Disney Marvel stole the plot from Spaceballs. No. How does Woman the Accuser plan on sucking an entire atmosphere, an ocean, and a sun through a relatively tiny space hole? No idea. The space holes just suck. 
like this movie. But this plot device did bring us the headline of the year from the Irish Times. The Marvel's review, the Marvel Cinematic Universe disappears up its own black hole. <laughs> and it's all downhill from here. The Marvel's features mostly characters you don't care about and one you used to care about, but we'll start with Miss Marvel, played by Amon Vellani. A fanfic Marvel employee, Sana Amanat, self-insert, if you want to know more about that, check out this video right here, that Disney Marvel will tell you over and over again is an immensely popular character. And when one comes in that grabs the world's imagination like this, the questions are, when are we going to bring Miss Marvel to the screen? Well, all three of these heroes are very popular from their previous movies and shows. If popular means having her comic book continually canceled, appearing in the lowest rated Marvel show on D+, and being a lead in a video game that lost the company who made it $60 million? Sure, I have a question. If Miss Marvel is so immensely popular at Marvel, why did you fundamentally change the character by changing her origin and her powers? In the comics, she's an inhuman with stretchy powers. In the MCU, she has vaguely defined energy powers that are not supposed to remind you at all of Green Lantern. Amon Vellani seems like a charming young lady, but she becomes incredibly annoying in this, and no, it's not necessarily her fault. It's the fault of the inexperienced director Nia DaCosta and the horrible writers, and one of those writers is Nia DaCosta. And it's really sad when my description of how Kamala Khan got her powers, her grandma sent a bracelet in the mail, is exactly the same description the movie provides. Why did you get that? All right, now that we got the good parts of the film out of the way, and yes, that was the good, let's get to the rest. Tiona Paris plays unnamed superhero. Is it photon? Is it binary? Is it black girl magic? That gets my vote. Have no idea because they didn't give her a superhero name in the superhero film. A black chocolate woman with big, kinky, luscious hair. We are out here. Black girl magic! Of course, she has vaguely defined energy powers that are described like this. You can absorb light. I can see it. And they describe her origin quite as frankly, not as well as I did. Why did you get powers? I walked through a radiation shielding barrier of a witch hex and now I can manipulate and see all wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. I'm very happy for you. Now, they forgot to mention that she was positively affirmed as she walked through that magic barrier. You know, somebody should have said black girl magic. When they were handing out kids, they gave her the toughest one. Black girl magic! That's better. That's my quarter black magic in the editing room. And Tiona Paris is wasted in this like everyone else. Her character only exists to spout off techno babble because we need women in STEM. Like comparing the fractures in the space time continuum to fracking. Basically, it stretches and reconfigures space without rupturing the continuum. Like fracking, the more holes you drill, the more destabilized the shell becomes, and then earthquake. There's also some light forced drama with Monica Rambeau still being mad at Carol for abandoning her. By the way, no word on Monica Rambeau's dad. Considering this is the MCU, Maria Rambeau probably just made herself pregnant through female empowerment. Still, way to perpetuate a stereotype, Disney Marvel. This brings us to the men in this film, and yes, there are some men. There's body positivity personal assistant who has about two or three lines. There's man bun personal assistant who has about two or three lines. There's Prince Yan that's from the musical scene, which is nothing short of the ninth circle of hell. That scene made me miss prison. He gets a few lines, he gets to fight a little bit, and he provides our heroes with a costume change that looked like they're designed by Helen Keller from the AIDS quilt. Then there's Nick Fury after embracing his strange kind of love and secret invasion and abandoning an earth that he destabilized with a million potential radicalized scrolls. The once formidable Nick Fury is relegated to comic relief and hurting cats. I wish I was kidding. I don't know what Samuel Jackson was smoking to sign on to Secret Invasion and this, but his acting is atrocious along with most everyone else. He didn't even need to be in this film along with Kamala Khan's family, who were also supposed to be comic relief, but they're going to leave you needing cringe relief. And yes, there are more cats in this film, and I'm sure they're all female. To be fair, they did a better acting job than the humans. The Marvels doesn't just pass the Bechdel test, it rewrites it. And now it's time to talk about potentially the worst villain in the history of the MCU. In the grand MCU tradition of memorable villains like Ghost and the Taskmaster, we have another gender and race swapped villain. And yes, they leaned into the South Park meme again, and not for the first time in this movie. Put another gay diverse woman in it, make it my lame. Still no word on whether or not she's gay, it's just assumed at this point. Zowie Ashton is 
horribly miscast in this role. She's about as intimidating as a yoga instructor and looks like she's a soccer mom cosplaying as Dollar Store Ronan the Accuser. Then there's the acting, the constant monotone voice that sounds like she's talking with scaffolding in her mouth. Probably because she has scaffolding in her mouth. This can't be undersold. One of Woman the Accuser's goals is stolen from the movie Spaceballs, and the motivation for this makes even less sense, and it makes things worse. If you decide to torture yourself and actually watch this movie, which I know most of you won't, and you'll be better off for it, despite all of the homework you need to watch it, you're still gonna feel like you're missing something because you are. You see, sometime after Captain Marvel, that wasn't mentioned in WandaVision, Miss Marvel, Secret Invasion, or any of the Avengers movies, Carol Danvers went back to Hala and destroyed their AI, the Supreme Intelligence, which destabilized the entire planet, led it to a civil war that somehow exhausted the ocean, the air, and the sun. I mean, who in the hell wants to see that? Give me some silly billy shenanigans and hurting cats. That's right. The best Captain Marvel movie is something you'll never see. It was told in a horrible CGI flashback. But ultimately, it turns out that Woman the Accuser is just an idiot. Just like with Indiana Jones and the Dial of Dysentery, where they were chasing a MacGuffin that was never going to help the villain achieve his goals, making the movie completely pointless. They do the same thing here. Woman the Accuser was in pursuit of the other quantum band that Kamala's grandma didn't send her. Well, when Dirt Ben finally puts on the other bangle or quantum band, she explodes. So if Woman the Accuser had found the other nega band, sorry, quantum band at the beginning of the movie as she intended, there would be no movie, which would have been a better idea. And I wrote a lot of fan fiction. Quick side note, apparently the Bengals are not nega bands like we initially thought because they are associated with Captain Marvel, but they're quantum bands, which are more associated with Quasar. But I'm guessing Marvel just didn't want to use the name nega bands. That's crazy! But it gets so much worse because the true villain in this story is what should have been the titular character who got demoted in her own sequel, Captain Marvel. The Annihilator, who annihilated this film with her acting or lack thereof it. Brie Larson was just going through the motions in this movie, and yes, she is worse in this than in the first Captain Marvel movie. And I have to agree with my good friend Mahler's assessment what there was of the Captain Marvel character was completely assassinated and then defiled. We were told multiple times in multiple MCU films that Carol Danvers couldn't return to Earth because she was too busy helping people across the galaxy, except for the time when Maria Rambeau's cancer returned and Carol came back to look after the cat. But it turns out what she was doing at least part of the time was committing genocide. And then of course, there's the little things that prove that Carol Danvers, Captain Marvel is a dick. When she destroyed the Supreme Intelligence, she blew the top off of that building. I wonder how many innocent Kree died. She blew off poor little Monica Rambeau for 30 years because she felt bad about the genocide. That's right, Carol Danvers was completely aware that the Kree planet of Hala devolved into a civil war due to her actions and didn't do shit about it. This comes from a scene with Carol Danvers describing what happened to Hala, saying the air was poisoned and there was a drought. For Hala. The Kree Civil War basically bankrupted Hall of its natural resources. The air is barely breathable. They're suffering from a drought. That's a really strange definition of a sun going out. There's also the scenes where Carol Danvers clearly knows that if she uses her powers, she will switch places with young Kamala Khan. And she's clearly frustrated, but it's only because she keeps switching places and she doesn't give a crap that she keeps putting Kamala in dangerous situations, including one time taking off and flying. She abandons a bunch of scrolls she could have easily saved on the planet that woman the accuser stole the oxygen from. And yes, it sounds stupid just saying that. By the way, because there wasn't enough diverse women in this movie, the remaining scrolls are saved by, I'll give you one guess, Valkyrie, a diverse woman who's gay and lame. Just in case you didn't know, this is the Valkyrie from the comic books. This is the Valkyrie from the MCU. I know the resemblance is uncanny. Then of course, the Marvels go to the singing planet where Captain Marvel is in a platonic marriage with Prince Yan, and the thing that's the most frustrating is we, the audience, had to sit through five minutes of some of the worst cinema I've ever seen, and it was inconsequential. Woman the Accuser arrives on Prince Yan's singing planet to steal their water, and she does. Captain Marvel and the Marvels <laughs> off, 
And if it wasn't for one throwaway line towards the end of the movie, you would think everyone was dead. But the worst is yet to come. And you know that little drought that Carol described that ended up being the Kree homeworld sun going out? Well, it turns out Carol Danvers' Captain Marvel could have fixed that problem all along. Despite having trouble with the help of Miss Marvel and Monica Rambeau taking on a basic bitch Cree, apparently Carol Danvers' Captain Marvel can restart a sun. That's right, Captain Marvel can restart a sun instantly with what, a cosmic fart? But unfortunately, Monica Rambeau is lost in another universe after she had to go to the other side to fix the space hole that the now dead woman the accuser created. Also, we could get a post credit scene with her mom non-binary and a horrifically tacked on CGI beast, setting up the only Marvel movie anyone gives a shit about anymore. You know, the one with the Fox X-Men. In another post credit scene, Amon Villani's Miss Marvel is gonna set up possibly a mostly, if not all female young Avengers Avengers, and I'm here for it. But considering recent events, I'm guessing we'll get a Young Avengers D plus TV show or film right around the same time we get a Shang-Chi or an Eternal sequel. Bad doesn't even begin to describe this film. It is abysmal. It's a dumpster fire. No, it's not necessarily woke. It is filled with intersectional feminism, but it's not as bad as Captain Marvel. What it is, is just awful. Awful directing, awful acting, awful editing. The CGI was horrific, and I'm guessing the catering sucked. To borrow a phrase from the great comic book girl 19, it's a film filled with no fun Marvel mommies. And just to add to that, it's a film made by no fun Marvel mommies for no fun Marvel cat mommies. And they didn't even want to see it. There's not enough wine boxes in the world to make this okay. This is not okay. <laughs> It's just not. Narratively, it's a mess. As a matter of fact, it doesn't exist. It's like a poorly adapted coloring book. I'm sure people will be entertained by this, but I'm guessing those same people would be more entertained by a laser pointer than the cats in this film. And once again, despite all the homework that you really didn't need to watch, including the film's predecessor, Captain Marvel, and the very short runtime, which still felt like a very long film, I have lots of questions that I'm probably not gonna care very much about after this video, including how did woman the accuser get the universal weapon when it was clearly destroyed in Guardians of the Galaxy? Why couldn't King Valkyrie take in the scrolls from Secret Invasion? Did I miss the long history between Carol Danvers and Valkyrie outside of the few minutes they fought together at the end of Endgame? And we definitely missed the part where they hooked up. How the hell do you restart a sun by sucking another sun through a space hole? How did the entire population of a planet survive without air, water, and a son. How did Woman the Accuser and Man Bum personal assistant breathe when they were clearly on the surface of a moon with no atmosphere? Who in the fuck thought it was a good idea to put a cringe-inducing five-minute musical scene where its only achievement was to let the audience know what hell actually feels like in a Marvel film? What was in Woman the Accuser's face? Who thought it was a good idea to spend over a quarter of a billion dollars on this movie, then actually make it and then actually release it. From the well-known misogynist outlet, The Hollywood Reporter, box office bomb. The Marvel's opening to 47 million to 52 million in new low for Marvel Studios. The movie's performance fuels the theory that superhero fatigue is real. Well, MCU fatigue is real. If a pick doesn't deliver on every front or any front in this case, we're gonna hear the excuses. We're gonna hear the spin. We're gonna hear the cope. But the fact remains, the jig is up. This pair of headlines, which turned into an unintentional meme, I believe sums it up perfectly for the Marvels and the MCU. Last time I checked, the highest grossing movie of the year was a film that wasn't made for me, Barbie. So it turns out the Marvels wasn't made for me or anyone else. The Marvels becoming a flop was a sure thing. Many of us saw this coming a long time ago and never had a doubt. It was just a matter of how much money it was going to lose. And it turns out a lot. Nobody has a problem with women being in the MCU. It's how they're written, directed, and portrayed. And now that we're at the end of the MCU, although Disney Marvel doesn't know it yet, the only question I have left is, why does Disney Marvel hate women? That being said, representation does matter. We here at Nerdrotic have always believed that a diverse woman could direct a flop just as poorly as a white male. Nerdorotic.com If you like what you heard, please like, share, and subscribe. If you didn't like what you heard, I thank you for listening this long. I'll see you in the next video.